Welcome to another episode of Stand, where we resist cancel culture like Joan of Arc resisted the English. I'm Kelly Chewbacca, and I'm here today, as always, with my favorite co-host and husband, Nikki Chewbacca. Just a friendly reminder, you can subscribe to our show on YouTube at The Stand Show, or hit subscribe to the podcast platform of your choice. And anyone who wants to join our chorus and crowd of standouts in our friendly community that makes this show happen, please do share the show with a friend or family member who you think would love to be part of the standout community. We are not silent about the things that matter, so you can join us too. We are on social media under Kelly for Alaska, and if you want to be that lucky audience member who wins a free Hydro Flask sticker from Stand, make sure to leave a review. We will be picking a lucky audience member this week, and we'd love for you to be that person, so please leave a review. As always, we have a great show for you today. We have promised we will bring on national leaders, entrepreneurs, authors, and also everyday Americans who do extraordinary things, and that's what we have in store for you today. We're joined by Gloria Giorno and her son Stevie, and they're going to tell their story about how wokeism at Stevie's university tried to silence him, and they failed. That's the exciting story. But Stevie chose to stand and speak out. So even in the face of threats to his safety and his life, they stood firm and they were not able to cancel him. His family stood with him. It's truly an incredibly and inspiring story that we're going to get to hear. But first, a little bit about these two. Stevie is a recent graduate of Belmont University, where all of this happened. He was president of the student body, elected with over 95% of the vote. And today he's chairman of the Tennessee Young Republicans. I've also been told he's the youngest person ever to serve as the second vice chair for the Republican Party, not just the Young Republicans, of Williamson County, where he lives. His mom, Gloria, is a first-generation American. Her parents immigrated to the U.S. from what was once the communist nation of Yugoslavia. Gloria is the founder and president of United Women Foundation, an organization that mentors and awards college scholarships to women who are conservative female students. She's also the author of a book we're going to talk about today. It's called Outcast. How the Radical Left Tried to Destroy a Young Conservative. So you can find it, you know, pretty much wherever books are sold on the Internet. We're looking forward to talking to you today about that book, Gloria. It's based on what she and Stevie experienced. You don't want to miss this. So, Gloria and Stevie, welcome to Stand. I know your audience is going to be inspired about your story. Nikki and I have already talked to you about it, and we're so glad to get to share your story with our audience. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's it's awesome to have a mother and son story of courage standing um, against this this approach to silence dissent or, or differing voices. Um, it's just a beautiful picture of how uh, freedom is a family matter, too. It's not just an individual matter and it's a community matter. It's a city matter. It's a state matter. It's a national matter, but it starts with the family. So. Um, Thank you both for being such a wonderful example of that. We'd like to start off just getting to know a little bit more about you. Gloria, you are a first generation American, as Kelly mentioned in her intro, and your family immigrated here from Yugoslavia, uh, which the former Yugoslavia, which is a communist country. Could you tell us a little bit about your family's history and uh, what you learned from your parents and grandparents about what it was like living under communism? Well, um, my father came to this country in 1956 and my mother in 1961. I grew up knowing that communism was something that you never wanted to live in and both my parents stood against it. My parents taught me that in communism you have no freedom of speech, you have no freedom of worship, you have no freedom of anything. Everything that you have belongs to the government. Hmm. You do not have the freedoms that we take for granted here in America. I grew up knowing that I went to school in communist Yugoslavia for first grade. And I grew up knowing that that police officer who I saw every day on the corner while I was walking to school, he wasn't there to make sure that I was all right. He was there to make sure that no one would speak out against communism or Yosip Tito, who was the dictator at the time. I also knew that 
I had a thousand US dollars. I was six. I had a thousand US dollars in my backpack. And I knew that if civil unrest broke out, now imagine being six years old and being taught about civil unrest. And I knew that if civil unrest broke out to get into a cab that was waiting for me at the corner, and that cab would take me to the border of Serbia, or actually, I'm sorry, Yugoslavia and um, Italy. And I knew that that was my way to get out. And my parents would come when they were able to. So in families like mine, we have a great appreciation for America and for everything it stands for. And my father passed that along. My mother passed away many years ago, but my father, Stevie, knew my father. And my father passed that love of America to both of us, to all of our family. Mm. My father was a proud American for 57 years. He changed his name from Andra to Andrew. When he came to this country, he had $10 with him. And he got a job at a company that had Italian. They spoke Italian, as did he. He took night classes to learn English. My father became a shining example of a successful American immigrant. And I'm very proud of both my parents. My mother was a PhD tenured professor from the University of Chicago. So I'm very proud of both my parents and what they accomplished when they came from nothing because they lost everything during the war. Mm. My mother's home was taken over by the communists. And so they were displaced. So they were sent somewhere else. They eventually ended up in Lyon, France. That's where my mother came here from. But the things that my dad taught my children will always resonate. And I feel that's what taught Stevie to stand up for himself more than anything. I mean, my stories, my dad's stories, that's what Stevie learned from. And we've always taught our family that. We've always said, after America, there's no better nation. There's nowhere else to go if America falls. And we have always placed an emphasis on freedom of speech, the second amendment, freedom to worship, freedom to be who we are, and respect for the government, the police department, and everyone who is in this country. So that's a great background story, Gloria, for why your family loves America so much and would love something like Independence Day. So Stevie, what was it that happened on July 4th, 2020, that sparked a raging controversy and national news coverage at Belmont University. What is it that you did on summer vacation? Well, it was around 7 or 8 p.m. I remember very vividly it was after uh, my parents and I had dinner together and right before I was going to visit with some friends to shoot off some fireworks. And I remember it was raining a little bit. And I had posted a picture of myself in front of the White House that my parents took a few years prior from our last trip to Washington, D.C., and it was a picture of me in a sweatshirt. Wait, let's pause. I'd like to ask our Mr. Producer to please put that picture up so everybody can see what a great picture it was. This is such a nice picture. Okay, go on. And my caption on the photo on the 4th of July was that I was proud to be an American, and I thanked our forefathers and those who had served so that we could have freedoms and liberties that we have today that our forefathers intended for us in 1776. And within hours, I remember being at my friend's house and people calling and people texting saying, have you seen what's going on with your Instagram? And at the time I had my notifications off because I don't really like social media. I think it's an evil, terrible thing. It's just a necessary evil nowadays. But I remember looking at it and there were hundreds of negative comments from fellow students, friends of mine at Belmont University, people I knew and people I didn't know, saying that I was a racist, that I was an awful person. There were people saying that I needed to kill myself because I was celebrating a racist holiday and that I should be ashamed of myself and I needed to apologize. And really what it boiled down to was during that summer of 2020, when BLM was rioting and burning down cities and destroying private property and killing innocent people, I refused to post a black square on my Instagram page. You know how many people were doing it in their stories. Uh, I refused to do that, and I refused to endorse the BLM organization because my cousin was a police officer who was shot and killed serving in Chicago. And so I'm never going to support an organization that 
calls to defund the police that 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 dishonors the memory of those people like my cousin who served honorably to defend everyday people and i wasn't going to do that and so the very next day july 5th there was a change.org petition created by students at belmont where they said that they were going to impeach me because i was celebrating a quote covertly racist holiday and if you google my name i'm very proud that it's still one of the the first things that pops up that these people you know there were hundreds of signatures almost 400 and many people commenting and it was one of the most difficult times of my life to have a school that you know voted for me almost unanimously to represent them you know just because i said i was proud to be an american and thankful that we don't live in communist countries like Yugoslavia or the Soviet Union and that we don't live in North Korea or Canada. Right. Uh, you know, it's let's, just, it was Stevie, let's pause right there. And it's a great place to take a break because I want to jump right back into that story right where you were. Um, so heart wrenching. I'm glad you mentioned that it was difficult for you because I think one of the things our audience wants to know is why didn't you just take the post down? So many people would have just, you know, seen the heat and backed away from the fire. And it must have been difficult, especially being in a, a position of public prominence on campus. Um, so many people, you know, nearly the entire school liked you, and then overnight nearly the entire school didn't. Let's pick up with that story after the break. Stand by. You're with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca on stand, talking to Gloria and Stevie Giorno about how Stevie tried to, they tried to cancel him at a Christian university, but he would not be canceled. Stand by. We're back with Gloria Giorno and her son, Stevie, and boy, do they have a story to tell. We were just beginning to hear about it uh, in the last segment. We're going to hear more on this side of the break. But Stevie, before you get jump back into your story, I just wanted to reflect on what you shared about people wanting you to post that BLM uh, insignia on your Instagram post. It's all part of the whole virtue signaling, which really bothers me because I don't believe virtue can be signaled. Virtue is lived. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a really dangerous thing when people think that they've actually been virtuous by performative acts. So um, the virtue in all of this was what you did, taking a stand for what you believed in and, and doing it with integrity, courage, and quite frankly, respectfully uh, and with dignity. So go on and um, please, please pick up where we left off. Yeah, you're talking about how this was a really difficult time and you just stood firm through it. So what made it difficult for you? Well, I think the biggest thing for me was at the time I belonged to a fraternity, the only fraternity at Belmont. And these had been my brothers for, you know, over a year I'd been in this fraternity and they were great people. It was, you know, politics did not matter. You know, at the time before July and June and May of 2020, it didn't matter if you were a Republican, if you were a Democrat, if you didn't care about politics, everyone got along. You know, Belmont is a small school of only, I think at the time it was seven or 8,000 students. And so I think the, the hardest part for me was in those weeks following me posting that I was proud to be from this country, I had a few fraternity brothers reach out. And at first they said, hey, you should consider saying Black Lives Matter and getting behind the organization because people are, you know, starting to talk about it and they think that they that you don't understand how America is a racist country. And of course, America is not a racist country. And that's what I would tell them. Well, it got worse, much worse those following weeks when I was referred to the standards board of my fraternity, which is the uh, kind of like the judicial branch. And they usually only refer brothers who have broken the law or have, you know, done things that are not up to the standards, standards of our fraternity. Well, a fellow brother of mine referred me because he called me a racist because I would not endorse the BLM organization. And Tennessee, fortunately, is a single party consent state. It's a beautiful state and very grateful that we left Chicago to come here. So I knew something was wrong. I just had a, a very bad feeling about it. So we scheduled these Zoom meetings and I recorded them with my phone while I was doing the Zoom on my laptop. And in these meetings, these brothers of mine say that if I don't 
endorse the BLM organization if I don't apologize and don't take down my post. They were going to do whatever it took to destroy me uh, because I was standing up against the the waves, the torrents of people that were just bowing down to the, the woke mob because they were scared of, of being criticized like I had been at the time. And so, unfortunately, my my big brother of the fraternity who chaired the standards board meeting told me that if I did not do what these students demanded of me in my fraternity, that then that they would take action and, and get rid of me from the fraternity. And then, of course, the fraternity a few days later ended up endorsing the organization. And I left the fraternity out of protest along with two or three friends of mine who were very supportive. So even though it was very difficult, you know, having my brothers turn on me, the students, uh, all of my friends, there were a few of them that, that stuck with me who I still talk to today and they've never compromised. Now, I'm always very grateful for their support because they made it a lot easier. They made the, the tough days a little easier and they went by a lot quicker because I had people like that supporting me. Hmm. It sounds like bullying behavior. So knowing everything you say, um, like you mentioned, the it, it, things were political, but the post that you're talking about wasn't overtly political. I mean, you haven't mentioned anything Republican or Democrat in your post. I know a lot of Democrats who love America and celebrate July 4th. Um, and it's interesting that they were actually like demanding and forcing compelled speech in order to be a member of the fraternity. And then same thing with the university. Um, you don't get to be student body president unless you conform and your compelled speech that's actually surrendering and trampling on your constitutional rights is, you know, going right back to Gloria's story, you're putting you right back into Yugoslavia. Uh, so interesting that the things that were being demanded of you um, were anti-American, fundamentally anti-American, but also for people who remember that time or remember some other things that have happened recently, the America that we can kind of live in now one of the reasons this method works is because so many people, as you say, just lay down and submit. When you're faced with that kind of an onslaught of pressure, they would just take the post down or just say, yes, I think the lives of people who are black matter. And so if you want me to put a black square up now, all the pressure goes away. Why didn't you? Well, for a few reasons. One, I would never told what to do or threatened of what to do and told you must do this or else it's like you said on American and I remember you know I was 12 13 14 years old and I remember listening to my grandfather who was mm. born in 1923 in Yugoslavia so you know in the 40s when he was around my age he was hiding from Hitler and in the 50s he was trying to escape from Tito and I just remember talking to him of him saying the government told you what to say they published the only mm. paper uh, and I remember him telling me that he knew people that spoke out against the government and they wanted to kill those people. And so when all these people were rushing blindly to support this organization, which has now proven itself uh, to have given the founders very nice homes in L.A. and around the country, you know, I just I, I had my suspicions. Uh, but also, I think that it was just on their on their website. It said they were self-avowed trained Marxists. And they were an anti-Christian organization. So it would have been easier, absolutely, like you said, to, to take down the post and the, to say, you know, I, enough is enough. I just want to get along with people. But what I realized was no one would remember this years in the future except for me. And I would have to live with the decisions mm -hmm. I made. And my parents would remember the decisions I made and my friends did. So I wanted to make sure that I made myself proud and stood up for what I believed in and wanted to look in the mirrors and have no regrets, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the line. And fortunately, I can say that I, I think I did everything right. You know, I still, I, if the exact same situation happened, I would not have changed anything except instead of posting that picture on the 4th of July at 8 p.m., I would have done it at 8 a.m. so that those people <laughs> could have been having gotten it out of the way earlier rather than in the evening. <laughs> well, let's let's let me just quote what you said, because I don't think we've quoted that for our audience yet. This is what you said, quote, proud to be an American celebrating the sacrifice of those that gave their all so that we may enjoy the freedom and liberties our forefathers intended on this day in 1776. There is really nothing controversial about that. I mean, that is basic American history. 
and yet you were pilloried, you were attacked, and you you stood mm-hmm. your ground. So let me let me pivot, if we can, to, to Gloria. Um, in these last few minutes we have in this segment, as a mom, I can imagine you were really concerned about the vicious and unhinged responses that Stevie was receiving to his post. My understanding is that you reached out to Belmont University's leadership yourself. What happened when you talked to the university about the situation and what measures, if any, did the university take to to help Stevie? Well, Belmont is a small university, as Stevie said. So what I did, my husband and I decided we would reach out to the president who was supposedly always available. And when I called, his assistant told me that um, she knew that there was something going on with Stevie's social media. So they were aware of the situation, but she would have um, the president at that point call me back. And I waited and waited and waited. And of course, I got no phone call from him. But about three days later, I did get a phone call from their lead attorney, who point blank said to me, their lead attorney, yes, who point blank said to me, are you going to be suing Belmont University? And I said, what would I be suing for? I said, my phone call is to address the issue of, I mean, we thought COVID was going to be two weeks. So how is my son going to be safe on a college campus when we have students telling him to go kill himself? I mean, all if you read the comments, they're very threatening. And as a parent, it's very frightening. I mean, you have children. It's very frightening to have these children coming after, these students coming after your son. So my husband and I, we didn't even want Stevie to go back to Belmont, but he was never going to give up. So um, I made it clear to the attorney that my only concern was my son's safety. And he said, someone will be getting back to you on that. No one got back to me on that. So Stevie and I reached out to campus security and we offered to, um, we did a Zoom call with them as well. And we offered to have private security escort Stevie on campus. And they were not they were not okay with, you know, a private security person carrying a weapon, which I understand. It's a private university, it's their school, it's their property. I understand that and I respect that. And one officer who was on the Zoom call, who is with Belmont University, he offered to escort Stevie from class to class. When he got on campus, he offered to escort him on campus from one class to the next to the next. However, they told us that Stevie's vehicle, his car was not allowed on campus. They could not guarantee its safety. They had no idea what somebody may do to it. And so he would have to figure out a way to get to school. And he was living at home. He was not living on campus. He would have to figure out a way how to get to school. So we did, we figured it out. He parked his car um, at a friend's garage three blocks away and a friend or I would pick him up, drive him to school, deliver him to campus security. The police officer would escort him all around campus and, you know, then see, we would go through the same thing to get him back, you know, to his car. So it was crazy, but Gloria, that is the only Let's pause right there. I want to pick up there right after this break. I want to find out how long this had to go on. <laughs> it seems like a lot of hoops to have to jump through and every day feeling extremely stressed out, not knowing who was going to come at you at campus wanting to kill you. Uh, we're with Stevie and Gloria Giorno talking about Belmont University trying to cancel Stevie because he celebrates the 4th of July. So we'll be right back after this break. Stand by, and you're on stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. Okay, we are back with the uncancelable Stevie Giorno and his mom, Gloria. We were just talking about how um, you had to have a security detail on you when you were on campus, but that you had to be essentially <laughs> dropped off like kitty drop at campus because <laughs> they wouldn't let you park on campus because they couldn't guarantee the security of your car. How long did this have to go on? Well, this lasted from my entire second semester as a student body president. I had to constantly look over my shoulder and worry that one of these students who said, and there were students that put this in the official Belmont College Democrat group text that if they saw me on campus, they would attack me. And, it, you know, they wanted to beat me up. They wanted to punch me. They wanted to punish me for being proud uh, to be an American. But in the end, that wasn't even the worst part. The worst part was not students saying, we're going to attack you. It wasn't having 
security with me whenever I was on campus. It was on the day of the presidential debate, the final presidential debate, where President Trump debated Joe Biden at Belmont University. Uh, I found out from a friend of mine who is a Democrat. He was very nice. He was on my cabinet in student government. He sent me a screenshot. And in it, it was of the Belmont College Democrats, and they were speaking poorly of me. And this one female student who apparently knew me, I did not know her, she told everyone, all 100, 200 Democrats in this group text, that she had been putting, quote, gross stuff in my drinks whenever I would go to her fast food establishment in the morning. You know, being from Tennessee, I love my sweet tea, and I need that every morning. And so she admitted to putting gross stuff in it. And that still wasn't the worst part. You know, fortunately, I, I went to the doctor. I was not ill. Uh, I called the police and unable, and they were unable, unfortunately, to investigate because I was healthy and because the Nashville Police so, Department is so understaffed. I just want to pause. Um, gross stuff can be a euphemism. You may or may not know what it was, but doesn't that essentially amount to food poisoning? Like, yes. we used to have food it, tasters it, for things like this so that the gross stuff would kill the food taster before it got to the person it was intended for, right? That's an assault. Yes. It is. It, it is. And so we called Nashville police and they said, well, you're fine. You're healthy. And we don't have the manpower to do it. And my friend who sent this to me, he, he texted her back and said, I can't believe you think this is acceptable. This is terrible. And she said, oh, don't worry. It's not like I've been putting rat poison or anything like that in it. And just the thought of someone making a joke about that, you know, is, is unbelievable. But the worst part about this entire experience was we turned this female student into Belmont University. We gave the screenshots with her name and her picture. Her confession. And yes, we, we gave it to the school. And a few months later, the school didn't punish her, and they rewarded her by accepting her into Belmont Law School. You know, that's just the wow. thing. This whole situation should have been something that the school used as a teachable moment for students about tolerance, freedom of speech, respect for different views. And instead, it sounds like they enabled bad actors to continue behaving badly, which is just it's horrible. And it's not what any educational institution, particularly a Christian institution, uh, should be engaged in. And the very idea that you were called a racist for supporting our country. I mean, what are they going to? What were their thoughts on black Americans who have fought and died for the very country they're saying is so racist? I mean, clearly these people saw something. We black Americans saw something and see something in this country that they're missing, which is we believe it's worth dying for, at least those of us who have gone out and served in our in our military. So it just it just boggles the mind. But we'd love to talk to you guys about the book. Uh, Kelly Kelly had a question about the book, and we're looking forward to chatting about that one. Yeah, so Gloria, what was your inspiration in writing this book about CV's experience, the family's experience at Belmont? Well, there were many things that compelled me to write the book. First off, I don't think that any student should be threatened on any college campus. I don't care if they're right, left, Republican, Democrat. Our children should be safe on every campus, be it grade school, high school, college. Where you live, we live in America. We should have some safety measures in place at schools. So my book is an educational tool for parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, to see what actually does go on at universities. This isn't something that only happened to my son. I realize that there are many children this happens to, and there are many books out there, there are many people who talk about it. The thing that I did that is different from the other books, as Stevie mentioned, yes, Tennessee is a one-party consent state. I have every recording. I was with mm. him for that call. Imagine sitting across from your son and not hearing all this and not being able to do anything or say anything. I am that parent who was there. And so I have firsthand knowledge of exactly how it feels, and I don't know what other parents do. I also try to include, I have included in this book, every screenshot, every text, every email. It even goes to the administration level. I mean, even the president of the school sending an email to Stevie that was just incorrect and improper and making a joke 
out of the change.org petition that Stevie was named in. I mean, he thought it was funny, but everything is included in the book. I mean, as we'd like to say, we call it like a picture book because it does have documentation of absolutely everything that occurred throughout this entire time. Even We even have a picture of when Stevie graduated. So everything is mm -hmm. in there, absolutely every detail. And the evidence is there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I know that the school has been reached out to by quite a few people who have interviewed us, but they've not come back with anything. They can't. Stevie followed the handbook. He provided administrators with absolutely every single detail. They have nothing that they can come back with. They have every copy, but he has the copies of the emails when he sent them over. So I think clearly- that that's, Yeah, I think that's helpful. I would like our producer to put the picture of the book online, Outcast, How the Radical Left Tried to Destroy a Young Conservative, so our audience knows what it looks like when they're looking for it online. I think what you're describing, the reason why this matters, not because you're handing it out to a lawyer who's going to build a case against Belmont, but because um, other families out there or people who are going through it themselves, you might be wondering, hey, what's really going on here? And you kind of, you get in your own head game thinking you might be the problem and, and it's you and you might just need to like sit down or lay down and just take it. And actually what you did, Gloria, is you you provided the expose. You brought into light what's been going on in darkness to show actually there's this whole collusion thing that goes on behind scenes in an effort to cancel those whose views are different and force them into compliance and to conformity and to compel their speech to align with what the extreme radical left wants you to say. And this is what it looks like. And so then people know this book essentially gives them a roadmap on how to stand. And that's what I think is so unique about this book. You wouldn't expect it to happen at a Christian university. You wouldn't expect it to happen when you got elected with nearly 100% of the vote. The, um, that's the thing is it happens at unexpected times, but that's when you need, this is the roadmap. This is how you get this evidence. And something else that you and I talked about for those who um, are thinking, hey, maybe do I need this roadmap? Um, Stevie, you kind of already mentioned it. It all culminates in the debate, which we watched on TV. But Stevie was there on campus when things kind of reach a fever pitch with the Trump-Biden debate, right? And kind of give us a teaser. I don't want you to tell us what happens in the book, but it, this all laid out in the book. Um, everybody is all upset about how racist and horrible Stevie is and this drink poisoning. And then your book will tell yeah. us, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, it will. The school was, was, was absolutely terrible. Uh, they went back on their promises, uh, and they made getting to the debate very difficult, but fortunately, and uh, we made it there. So I was very, very privileged to have been there and have seen President Trump do a great job uh, in making his case. Uh, but it, it is all in the book, uh, email by email. Yeah, so that that's going to be a fascinating read, the, um, the apex moment of this presidential debate. Um, and, then, and then after that, the book will detail out how we get to graduation and all of that. Um, and I just can't even imagine how harrowing this whole experience was. Stevie, how did that, how did school wrap up for you? What was the experience like? Were you like relieved and put that behind me? Or did it feel like victory? I summited that. Well, I remember being very nervous to go to graduation. You know, COVID was still going on a little past the two weeks they told us. And of course, Belmont University was limiting how many people could be in attendance. So I got to bring my parents and my brother and his wife, now wife. Uh, and so we're all masked, we're all socially distanced, and they sit all the students who are in the same majors together. Well, I'm sitting by all these political science students who I know cannot stand me, and I can I can see them staring at me. You know, everyone's wearing a mask, but it's a small school. They know who you are. And I remember sitting there and for weeks, my parents said, what do you want to do? Do you want to go? Do you not want to go? Uh, are you going to get booed? Do you think people will clap? We had no idea. And so I remember sitting there surrounded by these people who said if they were going to see me, they were going to attack me. And of course, mm -hmm. they didn't because they're keyboard warriors. And that's just about it. But I remember they get to the last names of G and they're going, you know, down the list and they're almost to me, and of course I take off my mask, I stand up when they announce my name, and I, I give a big thumbs up and a wave to the university president, and I was happy to to be done with the school. You know, I really thought that I was going to be booed. Uh, I had told my parents to be prepared for that, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and the craziest thing happened, people were applauding. And that wow. just goes to show that regardless of all the pressure and all the heat on social media, there are still many people who think like us and stand up for our values and beliefs. And so that was one of the most reassuring moments of this entire ordeal was expecting to get booed and people were there clapping and they were proud of me and I'm very grateful and, and thankful that they were there to, to show me that, you know, remind me that I did make all the right decisions that I yeah. felt that our family was doing. It was one of the, the, the most surreal moments of my life. <laughs> that's fantastic. Stevie, that's super inspirational. I like how you call them keyboard warriors. But the fact is, when you actually take a stand and go into the heat every day, model that courage on campus, you actually have a lot of supporters that you're rallying and inspiring behind you. Stand by. We're going to take a quick break. You're on stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. We'll be right back. We're back with Gloria and Stevie Giorno. We're talking about a book that Gloria wrote called Outcast, how the radical left tried to destroy a young conservative. You can buy it on the internet. Websites like amazon.com, barnesandnoble.com. I'm sure you have been on the internet for a while. It also shows how you can take a stand simply by using your pen. So I just want to follow up, uh, Stevie, with you about your story. You know what? One of the ironies of all of this is in you taking a stand for freedom of speech, for what you believe, you are actually taking a stand for all of those other students who are threatening and opposing you. Because mm -hmm. in standing for freedom of speech and free, you know, the rights of conscience, you were advocating for them even as they were attacking you. And that's why... When I talk about, when I think about virtue, that's the, that's virtue, right? That's not acting like you're virtuous. That's actually being virtuous. And so I just mm -hmm. want to commend you for that. Um, that, that's just such an incredible story. And I think it's something that will inspire not just young adults, your age, but, you know, folks like us, you know, and, and, and others to remember that, um, uh, all of us can do something. We can't do everything, but all of us can do something. And it something as simple as standing, which is what you did, made a huge impact. And you saw it to graduation, all these other people who were silent. Yeah, good right? point. And they applauded you in the end. They were standing with you. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully in the future, those same people will have been inspired by your courage and your integrity and your virtue and we'll do the same in some situation going forward. So I just wanted to emphasize that that it was just an amazing story. Gloria, you're the founder and president of the United Women Foundation. It's a nonprofit that mentors and provides college scholarships to uh, conservative female students. And I think that's fantastic. You're, you clearly have a passion for mentorship. You've very clearly mentored your sons very well. I mean, they, uh, I haven't met your other son, but Stevie is just an incredible young man, um, incredible young man. So would love to hear more about United Women Foundation. Why did you feel there was a need to develop a scholarship fund and a mentorship program specifically for young conservative women? Well, when Stevie's incidents were going on at Belmont, a lot of young women came and started telling him what was happening in their lives. And there were a lot of similarities there. And so um, they started telling me their stories and their stories are horrible. I mean, young women are targeted much more so by the radical left and the left than young men. Stevie happened to be in the line of fire. But Young women are targeted because the left glamorizes being a Democrat and being a leftist and, you know, you can have control of your own body and, you know, abortions are okay. It's you. It's not the baby. So they're trying very hard to get to our young female population. And unfortunately, the Republican Party doesn't do as well a job as they should with branding and marketing, in my opinion. And I wanted to do something to be able to help these young women who are in these situations where they had nowhere to turn. So I thought about it and 
We started off as United Women of Tennessee originally because we were just doing Tennessee. And then we grew very quickly. And so they need a safe place where they can come to and talk to us and tell them what's going on with them and what is happening to them at work, at school, where not. So United Women of Foundation was born from that. And we meet once a month on Zoom because we're, our membership is throughout the country. So we do meet once a month and we do conduct interviews. I mentor the young women on how to do an interview. I also help them with their resumes because they don't learn that in college. Nobody helps them with that. So I'll help them with a resume. I'll help them with getting internships. Two of my young women interned for a senator here in Tennessee this past summer. One of them is still there. And um, I also try to get them employed with conservative employers. And one of my young women went on to do, um, she's with a political strategist, and she did a very successful campaign recently. And I'm very proud of all of my young women, extremely. And it only takes one person to start a conversation. And that's what I did. And now I have so many women throughout the country and young women especially that we're mentoring because we're all getting older and we need to look to the next generation to lead us. So we have to show them and provide them with the tools on how. And I have an amazing board. They're extremely supportive and they're everywhere. And so we work together and we come together and we do whatever it takes because we're far from winning this fight conservatives need to stand together. And that's exactly why I started United Women Foundation. And the book proceeds, the net proceeds from the book Outcast, do go to the foundation for scholarships for young women. And we do not base the scholarships on financial. We do not base it on if you are a straight A student. What we base it on is what are you doing as a conservative right now? And what will you continue to do throughout your life as a conservative. That is my main focus, conservatism. And that's everything that United Women Foundation stands for. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that with us. So when you buy the book, you're helping out this mentorship program and placing women on a new career track, getting them built up and supported. CV, speaking of these students and these conversations that you and your mom are having in this time, what words of advice would you have for students who are in a similar situation as you? They feel like they're outcast because of their values and their beliefs, or they may have even gotten some friction or been targeted or threatened, and they think that it's just better to shrink back, um, go undercover, uh, not speak up, and they're afraid of experiencing that kind of backlash. Having gone through this whole process now, what would you say to them on the other side of it? I think the most important thing is to remember to do what you think is right, not to bow down to people who are telling you what to think rather than how to think, which is a big problem we have in schools. I think secondly, uh, have a good group of supportive, pe supportive people. I was very fortunate that my parents and my family were always behind me, and I had some great friends at school who were always going to support me. And I think that it's, you know, I'm, I have the privilege now of serving as the Tennessee Young Republican Chair where I continue to hear of these stories happening at Belmont and schools throughout Tennessee and in every other state. And what we forget sometimes, you know, we're the silent majority by choice. We need to have more people speak out as to what is happening with them. And we need to highlight what they're doing to stand up and resist the pressures being put on them. And we've got to come together and, and, and cooperate and coordinate better so that people aren't going to be alone. Because I think that's the hardest part for young people is they want to fit in, they want to be accepted, uh, and they hate being the outcast. But we're not the outcasts because there's so many of us who have been attacked. Uh, we've just got to get together and work together if we want to see and be the change that we want to see in this country. So I would say that the most important thing is to remember that we are not alone. And however bad it gets, it will get better. Hmm. Just give time and remember that there are people that came before and will come after that will struggle with the same issues. And what you do now will determine how much easier fellow conservatives will have in the future or how much harder it will be for them hmm. if we end up tall now. Yeah, I like that. You're, you're breaking a trail. It makes me think of 
something you said earlier when you were like, I thought no one's going to remember this, but me, like, I have to look myself in the mirror every day. You know, fearlessness is formed in the fire. The only, the only way you can develop this is by going through it. And sofa sitters don't ever make a difference. If you're sitting there silent on the sofa, you're not actually blazing the trail for others. So those are really good words of wisdom. What are you up to now, Stevie? You're on the other side. You're a college graduate. You dress great. Uh, you talk well. You interview perfect. So what are your future aspirations? What are you thinking? Um, what trails are you blazing for other people now? Well, right now, like I said, I'm the Tennessee Young Republican Chair, so looking forward to getting a Republican back in the White House in 2024 and making sure that Tennessee stays a supermajority Republican state. Uh, a few months ago, myself and two partners uh, founded a business, a uh, security business, so we're looking at making sure that our schools stay safe and that we get armed officers to protect students in schools. Uh, but also I'm involved in Rotary and a few other organizations uh, just to give back. You know, I've been very fortunate that we live in Tennessee and that we've been given all the opportunities that we have here. And I love to give back and, and support the community that has supported me and molded me into who I am today. Rotary is fantastic. We've got great Rotary clubs up here, too. That's wonderful to hear. I'm sure we'll be seeing you again. Whatever you put your hand to, you know, doing good is always good for the community. And I think that's the story and our takeaway from our time with you guys today. So thank you for being with us, CV and Gloria. We really appreciate it. We appreciate the way that you've modeled taking a stand, everything you walked through, CV, on campus, um, only to find out at graduation that you weren't walking alone. You actually had a room full of people who are supporting and applauding you. And Gloria, you as a mom, there are a lot of parents right now who are probably listening to this interview going, I want that book. I totally respect that. That mom as a parent, it's really hard to watch your kid go through suffering and persecution and have to be, you know, at a distance listening and watching and not getting any support. But you're the one who collected the evidence and documented it all and made a case. And I can guarantee that having that support there is part of the reason why Stevie got through it. So what a great testimony this is. Audience, standouts, the reason why this story gripped our hearts and minds is because before Stevie posted a great 4th of July post, um, Gloria and Stevie were just ordinary Americans, um, just a college kid doing a college thing. And then this hit him. And that's what we're talking about, the life's challenges, one episode at a time. And they have a great story because they just stood day by day by day until they got through to the other side. And that's what we can do, too. And when you take a stand, you make a difference. Stand firm, stand strong. Follow us on your favorite podcast channels. Hit subscribe. Share this with your friends. Encourage one another because you can make a difference, too. We'll see you next week. Stand firm, stand strong.